good God Almighty, I hope you find me praising your name no matter what comes. Sing this with me. I can't count the times I've called your name some broken night. And you showed up and patched me up like you do every time. I get amnesia. I forget that you keep coming around. Yeah, ain't no way you'll ever let me down. Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me. Praising your name no matter what comes. Cause I know where I'd be without your mercy. So I keep praising your name. Top of my lungs. Come on, tell me. Tell me, is he good? Tell me, is he God? He's God. He is good. God Almighty. You say your love goes on forever. Your mercy never stops. So why would I assume you be somebody that you're not? Like the sun in the morning. I know you're gonna be there every day So what on earth could make me be afraid? Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me Praising your name no matter what comes Cause I know where I'd be without your mercy So I'll keep praising your name at the top of my Praise Him when the sun goes down. Love Him in the morning. Love Him in the noontime. Love Him when the sun goes down. Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me. Praise in your name no matter what comes. Cause I know where I'd be without your mercy. So I keep praising your name at the top of my love. Jesus when the sun goes down Jesus in the morning Jesus in the noon Jesus when the sun goes down Side. 
welcome to the last part of our series, Greatest Hits. This is volume two. Remember, we, a number of years ago we did volume one. But this whole series has been some of our teaching team's favorite psalms and what they mean to us and the impact they've had on our lives. How, what has it impacted my life? And the 23rd Psalm is one of the best-known passages in Scripture, and we felt that we could not do it justice in just one week. So today, we're in week two. So we're going we're gonna to go through the, a little bit more of this and kind of break it down for you. So if you recall, last week, we pointed out how the 23rd Psalm is different from all the other Psalms, or most of the Psalms, uh, in that it's very personal. It's almost like it's David's testimony of God's faithfulness to him. So during week one, we discussed how we have this tendency as, as sheep to wander off and get ourselves into trouble. And we'll each choose a shepherd to follow. We each choose someone to lead us. The question is, are you following a good shepherd? See, in Psalm 23, 1 through 4, we see what a good shepherd looks like. And then we see it also in John chapter 10. But in, in Psalm 23, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leaves me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And so this is what we kind of talked about last week, that we don't, we don't just need a good shepherd, though. As you read the psalm, it's not just a good shepherd. We need a good friend. In fact, we need a great friend. We need one that will never fail us. Now, I've had a many significant friendships in my life. Most were significant for just a season. When I was little, it was my mother and father. I, I, I still remember having scarlet fever as a seven-year-old and my mom taking care of me. She, I mean, she's put rags on my head, take temperature down, just constantly taking care of me. When I was in high school, I had this friend named John, and we were inseparable in high school. We went to lunch together each day, and we went on youth trips and mission trips together. And we were together all the time. And then when I started dating, whatever girl I was with became my confidant, my, my, my close friend. And then in 1992, I met the last significant relationship apart from God that I would have on this side of eternity. She took the place of all other relationships. And over the last 26 years, has been my greatest cheerleader, caregiver, companion, confident partner and in crime all those things she's been all the other relationships were important at the time and each of these relationships played a part uh, uh, in my in shaping me and supporting me and at times helping me keep my sanity as i went through the difficulties in my life you see we all have seasonal relationships in our lives you do i do if you were on a team or dance group or club you had friends where the group you had the, the group you had was there because you had was one thing in common where it's football baseball dance whatever when the season ended or you left the club those relationships ended it was not because something or someone did something wrong or because of conflict it was just a seasonal friendship now once you think about the relationships in your own life and how they've changed who was your best friend and closest confidant when you were seven now think about this, was the same person, was this the same person that was your best friend and confidant at 16? Then who's that person in your life today? I'm almost willing to bet that your best friend in elementary school is not your best friend today. And see, the thing is, we all long for deep and lasting friendship. We pursue it in romantic relationships and other relationships because we want someone who cares for us and has our back. But relationships change. We can't always count on those around us. People let us down. So today I want to talk about the most important relationship you can ever have and how it is the only one that will last. It is the one relationship that will never let you down because this friend is, is with you in the valley of the shadow of death. So the big idea today is this. Our most important relationship is our relationship with the Good Shepherd. Your most important relationship is your relationship with the Good Shepherd. So now as we took a look at the last two verses of Psalm, I want you to be aware that there's a change in focus here. In the first four, four, first four verses, um, they're about the shepherd. And the last two gives the imagery of a friend that hosts this banquet for us. These last two verses become even more personal and exude a great confidence in this friend. So I want you to look at what David says. In verse 5, he says, You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. So I want to talk about three things about this relationship. This relationship is personal. It's extremely personal. First, this is a table set for two. 
This is not for the collective. It's for you and your shepherd. This means the shepherd has personalized the table for you because he knows exactly what you need. He knows, a, he knows what kind of food you like and what, what kind of things you need. And while you're at the table, the shepherd anoints you with oil. And this is a weird idea for those uh, living in the 21st century America. But oil served a useful purpose to the Middle East as Bedouins traveled through the arid, dusty land. See, the oil was used to soothe the wind-burned and sun-burned face. It would make the face glow because it just it soothed it so much. It was also said the cup was overflowing with wine, again, in the arid Middle East. After a long journey, the wine would clear the throat. See, another psalmist wrote this. Wine makes the human heart glad, making his face shine with oil and bread that sustains human hearts. See, that was, that was something they did when a guest arrived at a home of a friend. The hospitality demanded the provision of oil and wine um, so the traveler could overcome the ravages of the journey. And when we go through the valley, we need rest and refreshment, right? When you go through the valley of shadow death, you go through difficulties, you need rest, you need refreshment. And when you allow God to lead you where he wants, he will, you will find a journey, a table at the end of the journey filled with love and mercy is set for us. But remember, it's a table set for two. The second thing is this, the relationship is sustainable. Recently, I was reading in my own devotion, Psalm 78, which is the history of the people of God as they were traveling the promised land. And as they traveled, they were surrounded by enemies, and they were in the desert, which was not a very hospitable place. And in Psalm 78, verse 17 through 20, the writer says this. He says, Yet they sinned still more against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. That's the history of the people of God, always rebelling against God. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the wilderness? He struck a rock so the water gushed out and streams overflowed. Can he also give bread or provide meat for us, his people? I mean, the history of Israel, man, that's just when you read through the, the Old Testament, you see that God provided for his people and they didn't always appreciate what God did. And it's possible in those times people of God were more concerned with their environment than God's provision. They looked around and saw the desert, and they saw giants, and they saw enemies behind every rock. And you see, the truth is God does not set the table where we think he should set it, but he sets a table. I, I want you to see where he set the table because this blows my mind. I just, I just can't wrap my mind around it. It says, the shepherd sets the table in the presence of our enemies. We're seeing this table surrounded by enemies in a place inundated with danger. And I don't like that. I don't like that idea. And it's crazy to me that God would set a table where my enemies can see me enjoying his goodness and grace. I mean, I'm not just sustained his table. I'm satisfied his table because he's got there the things that I need, the things that I want. And after walking through the valley of shadow of death, I find that God satisfies me. And I go, why would God, why would God do this? I mean, it's hard to wrap my mind around this because I would rather be feasting in a banquet hall out of sight of my enemies. I don't know, maybe somewhere like, I don't, I don't know, inside a church on Sunday. But you see, God doesn't set the table there. It's out in the open. It's in full view of everyone. And I enjoy this feast because I know that I have a shepherd that protects and leads. So even in the midst of my enemies, um, I can be like Paul and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in the sufferings, knowing that sufferings produce endurance, and endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God has poured out his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Man, I can relate to that. So I go through the valley and I see what God does and how he builds me and I grow in that. And here I am at this table and I'm looking around and I still have enemies. They're all around me. They never go away. We have, I have predators chasing me. And the Bible says I have this enemy that he's like a roaring lion seeking who he can devour. So my enemies are surrounding me seeing the blessing of God on my life as I'm feasting one-on-one -on -one with God. And one of two things is going to happen. They may see the blessing and hope and love and mercy of God and desire it for themselves and say, I want a God. I want a shepherd like that and walk away from whoever's leading them. 
But I want you to understand this. Nothing makes the world around us lose their minds more than someone living in joy in our messed up culture, someone living fearless where fear prevails, or someone who has hope in the midst of hopelessness. They look at us and go, man, they're naive. Well, we're not naive. We don't have to, our heads buried in the sand. What we have is we have trust in a good friend. We have trust in a shepherd. Regardless of what our enemy thinks or says or, or, or anything like that, we have a God that set a table for us. And so I can join Paul when he says, what then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He not even spares on some, but gave him up for us all. How will we not also have him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus, the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is the one at the right hand of God who intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? I love this. Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, and let me say this, or enemies surrounding us, can they separate us? Because as it is written, because of you, we are we're being put to death all day long. We're counted sheep of the slaughter. No, all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything created will be able to separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus. Man, I sit in front, in the middle, eating with my enemies all around us, and nothing can separate me because I'm one-on-one with the good shepherd, with my friend. And the end of the psalm encouraged me because my hope is more than just a feast in front of my enemies. David tells us this, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So the last thing is this, this relationship, it's eternal. It's for all time. It never goes away. This is much more than a feast. See, in the Old Testament, when you were invited to eat at someone's table, it created a special bond between you. Not just anybody was invited. And it would often culminate in some kind of covenant. In Exodus 24, the people of God are agreeing to follow the Lord. They're making a covenant with the Lord. And the elders and the tribes went to where God was, and they ate and drank as a sign of the covenant. You know, we do this every Sunday at the gathering. We take communion. In the same way, also, uh, it says, in the same way, also, he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant and my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. See, we forget when we come and do communion. When we do communion each week, you're renewing the covenant with God. At this table, at this meal, you're renewing this relationship with God. So what, all, what does all this mean for you and for me? Well, it means that we're more than mere acquaintances invited for a day. We're God's guests to live with him forever. We're invited to come home and quit wandering, and we're wandering all the time trying to find what leader. We're, we're invited home. See, nomadic people always long for a permanent home. T.E. Lawrence, who's also known as Lawrence of Arabia, wrote a book called The Seven Pillars of Wisdom in which he explained to the Western European world why Damascus was so important to the Bedouins. See, due to geography, the nomads would fight a tribe for the right to good land where, with water and lush, um, lush grass. Soon another tribe would come and fight them, and one displacing the other. But for the Bedouins, Damascus, with its rivers and land and plenty of area to grow, that was their view of the perfect home. We, too, long for a home that we can stay in forever. This home with no strife or enemies. It's a place of rest, no fear, and God offers this through His covenant. It's a covenant where goodness and mercy prevail. And what does this mean? What is the whole idea of goodness and mercy? When you take these two words together, it means that we have a steadfast love and support like you would expect from a good friend. This goodness and mercy pursues you. It's not lagging behind waiting for you to turn around and accept it. Man, it's pursuing you, chasing after you, right behind you. So that even in your rebellion, God's love is chasing you. He never stops giving. He never stops pursuing you out of love. His grace is always there for you. Not for a little while, but for all the days of your life and the life to come. When they follow the good shepherd, you'll be with him forever. And I think we then start asking the question, how can this be? How do I know it will never end? 
Because I'm a sinner. Isaiah said it. He said that we've all gone astray and turned our own ways. We've all ignored the shepherd. We've all pushed our friend away. I mean, I'm in, sometimes in constant rebellion. David even wrote this rebel and had an affair and was involved in a murder. Yet his faith in God's mercy never wavered. He turned back to God and had confidence. So my own life asks this question, how can I have confidence that I'm going to live in the house of the Lord forever, forever? How can I know that I can be forgiven? Well, again, we go to the Gospel of John where Jesus, the good shepherd, makes statements about his deity. He claims to be God. He says, I'm the bread of life. He says, I'm the light of the world. I'm the resurrection of life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And then John 8, 58 says, he is I am. The personal name of God. He identifies as the God of the Old Testament, as the one who is at creation, the one who all Scripture speaks of. So then when you get to John 11, he identifies with Psalm 23. In verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. See, he's the reason we can know that we will live forever. He is the one that the Psalm 23 says protects and leads and sets a table and will give us eternity with him. It's him. He is God. He says the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And he says there's another shepherd we follow. He says the hired hand. Since he is not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, he leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. This happens because he's a hired hand and doesn't care about the sheep. He goes on verse 14 and says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. He says, but I have other sheep that that are not from the sheep pen, and must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock and one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because again, I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. And I have the right to lay it down. I have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. And I want you to see something here. Because this is why we can trust Him. Five times, Jesus tells us that He lays down His life for the sheep. Because He is the Good Shepherd. He's not like the hired hand that runs at the first sign of trouble. See, so many people and, and ideas that we follow, when trouble comes, they flee and leave us to, and leave us to fight the battle for ourselves. They run, for, they run from the fight. Jesus never does that. He laid down his life for you. He is plan A and plan B for you. He did this so you can be reconciled to God and have a relationship with the creator of the universe. Because of this relationship, you have no need to fear. If you ever wonder about the commitment of God to you, look no farther, farther than the cross. See, Jesus died so that you could live with him. And I love this. It says, no one has greater love than this than to lay down his life for his friends. And then Jesus says this, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Man, we're friends with God. He doesn't call us friends because we're worthy. He does, we, we turn away while he pursues. He calls us friends because of his love. A love that laid down his life for us. And we show that we love him by being obedient. And again, we're going to choose, choose to follow someone. We each choose someone or something that we believe will get us into heaven. Many choose a hired hand only to find that he runs at the first sign of danger. And I can talk for myself. Personally, I've chosen Jesus because he protects me in the presence of my enemies. He satisfies me in the presence of my enemies. He has never, ever ever let me down. He's the only one that has given his life for me. A lot of people say they will, but he's the only one that's proven it and done it. And there's one other passage I want to look at before we end. It's found in Revelation. It says this, John writes, for this reason they're before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. The one seated on the throne will shelter them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor the scorching heat. For the Lamb is in the midst of the throne, will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And that's talking about Jesus. Jesus is gathering his people to himself from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. 
And because I've trusted in him, I will one day be in his presence. And get this, I will see him face to face. And I'll be satisfied and he will wipe every tear from my eyes. I will be with him always. And I got to ask you, do you have this same assurance? David did. This was his testimony. I do, and that is my testimony. You can have the same assurance in your own life, and it all comes down to who you follow. Are you following the good shepherd, the one who satisfies your needs, who gives you rest, who restores you, who leads you to the best place, who removes fear and comforts you, or are you following another? We're all following someone. And today I want you to know this. You can know for sure that you have a sustainable and eternal friendship with God by committing to following the good shepherd, Jesus. And if you'd like more information on how you can do this, text DECIDE to 919-877-6444 or email us at hello at thegathering.cc and someone will contact you. We want you to know there's a good shepherd who loves you. We want you to have a relationship with him just like David did, just like I do, just like so many other people do. So you can live a life without fear, a comfort, a life of comfort, a life restored. Will you pray with me? Father, we love you and we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this testimony of David we find in Psalm 23. Thank you for the testimony that you give us because of the relationship we have with Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd. And for those who may not have that relationship, I pray that they would step out and they would enter that relationship today or at least call and ask questions Text and ask questions so that we can help them to find what they, what they need and what they really, really, really long for. And that's a home for all eternity with the Good Shepherd. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Your name is high.